Um, and I hope it's, unfortunately I can't be here tomorrow, but um, I hope it's going to be a good, um, good set of discussions because I think there's, there's a key whole set of kind of perception stroke policy issues and leader issues that, that come together here that need to be interrogated. Um, thank Bauta for his talk. Now, um, Bauta sort of answered what I was going to talk about already by actually showing a slide that I produced some, some uh, about a year ago for a, a government policy um, uh, discussion, which kind of got swept away at the end of the discussion. No, these were, there were regulators in the room, and they were all kind of started looking at the ceiling when this slide came up, because um, they all thought the British response has been fine. But I just say that as an aside, and maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, so, about to ask me to talk about something slightly different, but there is a connection to his talk and the whole question of trust, which I've always suspected. Um, years ago, um, I did work on uh, the human and organizational causes of large-scale failures, which is why I became interested in risk research. So this takes us back to some of that work, which is quite long-standing work now, and so there's a good um, kind of academic background to all of this. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about, briefly about organizational accident theory, which is probably not, won't be necessarily um, uh, something that's familiar to most of you in the room, um, and why it was studied and some of the conclusions that it came up with, and then how that helps us to interpret the preconditions to the Fukushima disaster and what we might call it. Um, and uh, uh, it's interesting because our group were the only one really, everybody else has gone off to study genomics and stuff like that, perceptions of genomics or whatever, regulation for the last 10 years, funded generously by the SRC. So no, but none, of, none of the people who would normally be studying perceptions of nuclear power have been doing it. So our group, in a sense, have been the only ones to do it with the work, the survey work and both some of the local um, site-based work we've been doing um, with research council support. So it wasn't then very surprising. As soon as the Fukushima occurred, the phone started ringing very um, uh, from all sorts of sources, um, uh, mostly media, to ask for comments. But the most interesting approach I got in the immediate aftermath was from Nature. Um, and they said, well, uh, we do, I didn't know this, but they do classic book reviews of classic books. So they, so they said, would you do a book review as a result of the Fukushima accident, which is the most unusual outcome of Fukushima, I must say. Um, and they said, can you do Charles Perrault's classic book, Normal Accidents, and just situate it? So I, well, I thought this was a very nice thing to do, nice thing to be asked. wouldn't take long. I knew, that, knew it very, very well from my um, former work in this area. But I did say, ah, but now Perrault um, actually... His work has to also be situated against some of the European work that went on at the same time. Will you allow me to mention that as well? And they said that was okay, but as long as I focused on uh, uh, Perrault's book, which I, then, which I did. And there's a longer article actually in a, a journal called The Bridge, which is the journal of the American Institution of Str Engineering, Engineering Institution. It's their sort of house um, pop popular journal. They asked me after seeing this to expand on it, which I've done. So if you want to see that account, um, which doesn't talk so much about Fukushima per se, but it does talk about um, why we need to revisit some of these theories. So, um, and there are three books involved in all of this. Um, the one that I was involved in with the second edition, but was actually written, it was a PhD thesis that, that my colleague and Dick's colleague Barry Turner at Exeter at the time um, produced almost immediately within a year into a, a book that was uh, sold not many but um, got a very large coverage in the safety domain. So people knew about Barry's book, um, uh, even though um, actually it, w it didn't get a huge wide um, coverage. And then the thing that really changed all of this was um, Perro's book, Normal Accidents. That did have very high profile as soon as it came out. And he'd done an analysis of the Three Mile Island accident um, from a sociological perspective. I should say Barry Turner was an so organizational sociologist, as was Perro. So they both looked at um, accidents from a very, very different lens than had previously been used before. And then, tagging along behind, but who's really, he now has a Wikipedia entry actually on this, J James Reason from Manchester's psychology department. Um, and there's a f there, was, there was a famous um, incident down the pub after he'd come to talk at Dick's department, <laughs> where, sev <laughs> yes, we'd all had a few drinks, and then a colleague of ours, Brian Toff, told him it's not individual, it's organisational. And then about two years later, he wrote this big, article about it's all organizational, but we won't go into that. 
Um, so Jim was doing very similar stuff as well and became very well known, certainly in the aviation and oil and other industries, um, for his theories of risk and organisational accidents. But if you look at the two, you can see it's kind of a blend of all three. If you look at Jim's work, it is a blend of Barry's original disaster incubation ideas, but developed more, I think, in a more practical context. Um, so that literature is all there and, and available if you want to go and look at it. What did it say? Um, several things um, that uh, you could look at relevant cases of major failures, of which there were a number at that time. And in fact, the period 1975 to 1990, when we were working on it, um, it, it, it was a, a, year, a year didn't go by and then there was some major, major event. And we'd all sit there and say, oh dear, here we go again. The same things have happened again. So we had Three Mile Island right at the start, and then the Chernobyl disaster, um, uh, Challenger, the Space Shuttle, um, uh, Piper Alpha, Herald of Freedom Enterprise, a number of very, very large, very prominent failures. And the safety um, community at that time was looking very closely at that. I mean, we were more in the academic domain, obviously, but the practitioners were trying to work out what on earth to do about all of this. So, uh, so actually, they were quite receptive to some of the theoretical ideas that were coming out of, of the various bits of work. And th those have all gone into safety practice, actually, safety management practice, which is why my little story um, w will come as a, an interesting, I, s I guess, an interesting read, really. Um, so um, what did it say? It said that basically all three theories said that if you looked at technical systems, um, just as technical systems, they would all fail in different ways. They'd, but actually, uh, as soon as you realized there were individuals, there were organizations, there were societies surrounding these sy technical systems, then common, you suddenly started to see common patterns occurring. And my, again, my colleague Brian Toff would stand up here and say, oh, well, a technical system is, doesn't work without people. It, you know, nothing moves, goes, in, ex emits energy without some kind of person, organization doing something in the background. And then, then, therefore, as soon as you ask that, get that realization, then ask the question, well, were any of the people or organizations involved in the failures? Then you start to see common patterns across different domains. So whether it is, you know, flooding, um, it's a rail accident, um, or major flooding, um, it's a terrorist event, or um, some kind of air, air uh, that actually was a near miss, everybody got off that one, and you remember that, that was a British Airways flight that um, the, uh, the engines gave out just three miles from the runway. And, Fortunately, glided in and uh, everybody was okay. But that was a very, very major um, a shock to British Airways safety services at the time that that should never happen. Um, so, um, organizational accidents, um, it's organizations that manage major risks and occasionally they mismanage them. Uh, Barry used to say, actually, all organizations, m uh, in fact, mismanage most of the time. They kind of operate in, in degraded mode most of the time. And, 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 the, and the trick then is to kind of ensure that you're within a safety envelope given that not everybody does what they should do, always. Um, uh, the, and the, the key insight was these were not simple technical failures. I've said that before. Because at the time, if you went back to the 70s, the engineers would say, well, these were acts of God. You know, you just couldn't predict them. They came out of the blue. They were too complex. We couldn't uh, um, uh, actually put in any safety measures. Or it was an isolated human error. So it was the pilot's fault. It was the person who pressed the, the final button that made the final error and you then sued them and or, or threw them out of their job and, and, and then in a way the organisations then couldn't, there was no reason for the organisations then to question what they'd done or some of the surrounding assumptions. Um, and the, the three theories basically show very, very clearly why those two assumptions are absolutely wrong um, under most circumstances. When you've got a large scale accident, I'm going to say, uh, talking, talking about complex accidents. So the, uh, the idea, the, co the, the, the phrase that Barry particularly coined was these were complex socio-technical breakdowns, which was in, um, uh, ex expanded on by Perro. And again, think about complex organizations. An aircraft doesn't fly on its own. It, it has these whole series of human relationships that surround it. Um, it's more a human system actually than a technical system um, <laughs> I in order to work in a safe manner. And you can sort of see where I'm going with all of this. But the, so the theory goes like this. Again, you can think about very individual accidents, the simple things like breaking your leg walking down the stair or um, maybe having an accident on the road. And uh, individual accidents tend to be frequent, limited consequences, few causes. That's a critical thing, um, short history and localized failure. Whereas organizational accidents tend, or nor normal accidents, um, the title of the talk and Perrault's book, particularly rare, but organizational accidents in general are rare, 
have major consequences, many, many causes. That's the key thing, a long history, and normally tell you something about the, the system breakdown that's gone, down, gone, gone on. And why is it? Well, of course, Jim pointed out that the other, w the other three, had, the other two had talked about this. And it was Jim that sort of, <laughs> this Mr. Swiss cheese he's sometimes called, actually, in the, <laughs> in the less, um, uh, less flattering literature. He said, well, it's like a Swiss cheese model. All major systems that have significant risk atta attached to them, and nuclear power is the absolute paradigm of this, have multiple defences in depth built in, and they're both technical defences and their human de and organisational defences. Uh, they could be procedures or, or regulations, and, and no set of defences are perfect, which is why you have multiple defences. Um, so most of the time, a hazard won't get through all the defences. Um, but now and again, all the defences line up. And as soon as you start to look at major accidents, you will find three or four errors, an organisational problem, a piece of equipment that wasn't functioning in the way it should, etc., etc. It's always multiple things going wrong. And it's, that's a by, defini almost by definition situation that major systems don't fail for a single reason because normally one of the defences will catch the accident pathway. So you're always looking at slightly bizarre, complex sets of circumstances. Um, uh, Barry, who um, this was his thesis, and he'd um, based this on he actually had one of his major cases was actually Abervan, uh, uh, close to here, of course. Um, but he looked at a number of major inquiry reports over a ten-year period. Um, he did a very complex, in qualitative analysis of the um, uh, of, of the findings of those inquiries, and he made this observation: disasters incubate unnoticed. So I there's a sense in which you have a build-up of un unhappy conditions within the organisations involved, shared beliefs and assumptions, so blinkered management. So, and he was a, a very strong cultural sociologist, so he knew that organisations then um, impress a model of the world on their, in, on their individuals who, who are in the organisation. Um, and, and, and so Diane Vaughan, in her excellent ex um, analysis of the Challenger disaster, says um, the culture within an organisation is both a way of seeing and a way of not seeing. So your cult, your what's what eventually got to be called the safety culture uh, of organisations um, would allow you to see certain things because those would be prescribed hazards and uh, ways of, of doing things, but it would also um, permit you uh, kind of generate black spots and, and blind spots within the organisation. Um, and there's, so, ag again, um, Mary was kind of... He was criticised subsequently by postmodern accident researchers, if there is such a thing, um, uh, for kind of having this rather naive model that there's the perception that the organisation, the people have, and there's the reality out there. But then, having said that, if you really think about it in risk research, you sort of have to make, if you're doing accident research, you have to make the assumption that people are going to die somewhere along the line. Uh, and therefore, there is, a, there is a sense in which there's an objective reality that one's um, uh, working with. So I think that was kind of um, discussed um, as, as fairly sh uh, shortly, or about 10 years after the book was um, published. So, but I don't really want to go into that. That's just kind of a te technical debate that went on there. Now, the interesting thing, which is the first point of contact with Fukushima, is what B Barry did not define disasters in terms of the scale of loss. He said, no, that's not the case. What's really, what's, what's really a disaster um, is, is, is not the physical impacts. It could be the case that nobody died Interesting, nobody died from radiation. <laughs> um, but more, more fundamentally, it was the overturning and disruption of the cultural norms and expectations for dealing with risk and hazard. Um, so, for example, the Bradford City Fire, some of you remember 50 people, 50 fans died, and ma many of them died when the fire started in the football stand. They went to the exits at the back and they were locked. So the, ass the assumption there would have been the, e the fire exits would be um, uh, would be open and you'd be able to get out in a fire, but of course they were locking the exits because pi they knew people um, in, in those days were able to gain entrance to the ground without paying through the fire exits. So it, suddenly there's an overturning of the... the everybody assumes the fire exits are going to work, but here was a case where and actually um, non-functioning fire exits is a fairly serious and recurrent feature of buildings. None designed here, I'm sure, but um, anyway. Um, sorry? <laughs> I hope. Um, the way out's easy here. Bowser. Not by that, <laughs> no. Um, so the other point that Barry makes in his book, which is really interesting, is, is, is disasters are marked out by surprise. So major assumptions about safety are challenged, um, met with considerable surprise. So people actually say, oh, God, 
how could we have been so stupid or mistaken to have missed that? Um, and then, then the argument is there's a learning process, so beliefs and assumptions are, and norms, social norms, become modified and updated uh, after time. Now, again, we looked at that, and my colleague Brian Toff looked at that, and he actually concluded in his thesis, following on from Barry's work, that not all um, uh, beliefs and assumptions get modified for political reasons, but that's, that's another matter. Um, so, on the surprise matter, um, uh, and just th to make the point that, the point about sis if, if the underlying system is the same, it will fail in the same way. Again, that's an another um, key point that came out of um, Brian Toff's work um, that or he would always emphasise. And so, here's a kind of fairly simple failure, um, and you might just say that's not... Um, very interesting or doesn't tell us much, but actually there are lots of photographs on the net that look like that. Um, and you can see that's exactly the same system failure. So if the underlying system is the same, even though the technology is rather different, one was a very aged technology, this is a very modern technology, then you can get the same <coughs> failure pathway. And that then means you can learn from one system to another. And again, Barry always used to say, when asked by a chemical engineer, you know, how can we present, prevent disasters in the chemis chemical industry, he always used to say, well, look at another industry. It may well have happened somewhere else before. Um, look for clues there, which is part of the, uh, the idea of, of safety intelligence, I think, that we, we eventually came up with. So, um, to come get on to nuclear power after some of the theory, um, obviously, everybody here probably knows this, that in the 1950s, it was seen as the white heat of technology. There were even wonderful postcards. One of those is Sellafield. <laughs> um, fabulous book, this, by O'Brien, of the atomic postcards. The only one that's actually... Um, related to nuclear weapons, strangely enough, but it's, uh, which, uh, which I find interesting, the picture of Vancouver being obliterated. But all the rest from that era are very, very positive about nuclear power, and that was part of the discourse about nuclear power at that time, as you know. Um, but of course, then th this is Three Mile Island. Vat has shown that. The um, accident occurred there. Charles Perrault was asked to write a little um, commentary on Three Mile Island. He, ha he had some contacts with the Inquiry Commission, which he duly did. He had a look at some of the evidence. He wrote this thing. It went off. And the history is that I think that nobody took any notice of it. They, they kind of neglect it, neglected it. Um, and he writes this in his autobiography, which is on the public record. But it it had, in doing this, it came to him that there was a theory of accidents in there, in the um, actual um, chain of events that occurred. So he came up with a rather diff slightly different model. It's the same premise, really, that these are organi complex organisational technical failures. Um, but he came up with the idea that, that organisation systems of humans and um, technical components in risky situations had two properties. One was they could called interactive complexity, which is sort of how difficult it is to understand what's going on in the system because of its... And one of the ironies of this, pointed out by Jim Reason as well, is that sometimes you can add a safety system on and it makes it more complex, and so it actually makes it less safe in the long run, which is sounds... Um, engineers have trouble with that one, but um, that, that, that is certainly true. Um, so you end up... If you end up with many opaque interactive elements, then something that goes on somewhere in the system, which could look very trivial, may be affecting other things which eventually come back to bite you, which is what happened in Three Mile Island quite quickly. And then the idea of tight coupling, which is an uncontrollability sort of idea that lots of things concatenate in the system, and also if you have to act quickly and can't work out um, wh what's going on in time to put in appropriate control measures, then things, um, th things then escalate out of control. So that was his idea of interactive complexity tight coupling. And he defined a normal accident as as an accident that had occurred in a system which had both of these characteristics. Um, and uh, he argued that nuclear power, the pressurised water reactor type in particular, was the paradigm example of that. There's been a lot of debate about whether that is true or not, I might add, in the literature. Um, but um, let's, let's, let, again, let's pa pass over that. Um, um, of course, this is... And, so, and his argument was that any system that had tight coupling and interactive complexity at high levels should actually not, if, it's, if it also has high risks, should be abandoned. So his argument was that nuclear power should be abandoned because it was inherently unsafe and it would inevitably suffer normal accidents over time because of its uh, inherent system characteristics. Um, you can see that's a different model from Barry and, and, and Jim's model because their model suggests is much more about the cognition of the organisations involved 
and suggest that, and also is, all, uh, is about how warnings occur and defenses fail and partially fail and then eventually you get the full failure. So in their model, you've got much more optimism that in theory you should be able to predict accidents um, before they occur. Um, so I, I won't go on about Seamile Island. It was a, um, it's, there was a small fault and then some operator errors occurred and some interactions in amongst the pressurized water reactor components which led to eventually to loss of water from the, um, the reactor core. Um, the, I mean, the first issue with the Fukushima disaster is what was always been known about pressurized water reactors of the early generations, certainly, is that you, you must not lose water from the reactor core even if it's been closed down. And that was learned from Sea Mile Island, but was known. Um, and the second one is that in order to do that, you absolutely have to guarantee electric power to the reactor. Right, and that, those are the two key Achilles heel. And they come out of the fact that there, basically this reactor was scaled up from the early um, submarine reactors that the US um, uh, Navy designed, and that if you were designing a safe um, civilian reactor, you would not start from there. I think that's what the technology people would tell us um, now from history. But that's where we started from, and that's what these um, uh, systems uh, uh, were um, uh, designed from. So it's always been known that if you lost power completely, from a PWR, um, then you were in big, for any serious period of time, you were in big trouble. Um, so, um, before I go on to that, um, you might ask yourself, well, this was just um, the largest tsunami that had been in Japan. And that's one of the famous paintings that I'm sure you've all seen that. This was, and this was part of the media reporting here, and, and partly to, you know, um, uh, Bouter's answer to the question there about, well, in the UK, it was sort of presented that this was a huge environmental disaster, wasn't it? Why on earth should the, um, uh, should the reactor not stand up to that? It was just the effect of um, the environment. But that then kind of has taken me back to a little paper. Because um, uh, if, if, if you look at something from organizational accident theory, it's never just a single trigger. The environment may have been the final trigger that tipped it over, but pro almost certainly there was vulnerability sitting there in the first place. Um, and that takes me back to, I'm embarrassed to show this um, be just because of the photographs, but this is 25 years old, this paper. Um, and uh, um, a, a small case study, it was done here in South Wales, actually, that we studied. And um, in January 1982, there was this big snowfall over the j weekend of 7th to 10th or something. Everybody had gone home. And uh, a small factory collapsed under, s under the snow loading. And what was interesting about it was that the environmental condition, the snow, was not abnormal. The, the snow lying on the ground was about a foot. But uh, th what had happened was um, there'd been a step in the roof. Um, this was a, oh, it was a modern structure. It had just been built as well. That was an interesting thing. Um, but there was a step in the roof. Um, and uh, the, um, let's just see, yeah, it's somewhere here. Um, and a six-foot snowdrift had built up and it had <coughs> collapsed. Nobody had been harmed. A lot of um, the, the poor old factory owner who I interviewed was very upset about it all, um, and the insurers lost a lot of money, they had to rebuild it, um, and it might have stopped at that. You might have said, well, that was just the snow, wasn't it? But, th but, but for the two things, that it was designed within the codes of practice and the snow was not abnormal, and then when I went, they finally got to see the insurance underwriters, they said, but do you know 20 other buildings in the South Wales Valleys all collapsed on the same weekend for the same reason? Ah. So, and the engineers had told us, sort of said this was an interesting case, and so therefore it was a system accident. What had happened was they cha actually changed the method of um, production of the roof elements without, um, with that had made them slightly more vulnerable to loading uh, failure without looking at the implications on the code of practice for loading. And the code of practice for loading said you designed for an, a uniform amount of snow on a roof, and in the past it did not matter if you didn't get a uniform um, uh, uh, loading on the roof because the, the elements that had been used d during the war or whenever uh, had been over-designed, basically. So, or, so there was never any test of the, the loading code. Um, um, it was only when they actually generated these new um, types of structures that actually um, the vulnerability was, um, uh, was actually exposed. So this looked entirely like an environmental failure, but it wasn't. It was to do with the interaction between the new technology and the loading code. So, um, ooh, what's happened there? So what about Fukushima? Well, um, and Bouter has already, I hope I've not, mm. let's just see, it doesn't look like that's, that's 
to go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I went, uh, obviously, to look at the, um, and Bout has already um, uh, is, uh, talked about the, um, the inquiry report for the, the Diet of Japan, sort of the official inquiry report, and they actually described it as a man-made disaster. Very interesting. Um, and that's one of the quotes, and it says, um, uh, result of collusion between the government and the regulators and TEPCO, which is the um, uh, Tokyo Electric Power Company, and lack of governance by said parties. And th the point about betraying the nation's right to be safe, conclude the accident was clearly man-made, and the root causes were the organisational and regulatory systems that supported faulty rationales for decisions and actions. And if you, it's well worth having a look at this report. So I'll just briefly go through some of the reasons why they came to that conclusion. So they were basically saying the plant was sitting there vulnerable to tsunami and not so much earthquake, but certainly vulnerable to a major tsunami, uh, which was a known risk in Japan, as well still is, as, as our colleagues will, I'm sure, say as we go on. So was the accident preventable? Um, and they say in spite of the fact that the regulators were aware of the risks from such natural disasters, neither had taken steps to put preventative measures in place. It was this lack of preparation that led to the severity of the accident. So although I, I guess the accident would still would have been severe, we wouldn't have had the major um, core damage if certain, um, uh, certain uh, extra precautions had been put in place. And so if you look at it, um, a unit, the first one that on the site had, had was not actually capable of handling the earthquake that, occur that occurred. It had been built so early. And they sort of knew this, but then carried on regardless. Um, and there was some discussion in the report about whether that unit had been actually damaged in the first um, earthquake prior to the tsunami uh, actually overwhelming the site. Um, now, it's, it's true to say the design of the site was... Uh, made at a time of less knowledge, and this led to inadequate tsunami countermeasures. Um, but um, act then in subsequent years, research was done, and uh, it was pointed out there was a possibility of a catastrophic tsunami and loss of coolant accident um, at this particular site. But these warnings were then um, uh, really ignored or, or downplayed. And the regulators and the operators um, accepted a risk assessment that had been done by the Japan Society of Engineers, which in hindsight... Um, uh, involved a lack of critical scrutiny of the safety assumption. Um, so they hadn't asked the question, well, what if there is a tsunami hi uh, higher than this, and what is the risk of that actually happening? Um, the interesting thing in the report for me is where it says used arbitrary <laughs> interpretation and selection of probability theory to argue against additional countermeasures when they were raised. So in, in a sense, they were using... Um, almost a, a, a non-precautionary position. They were saying because the uncertainty, because there's uncertainty on these risk assessments, um, then actually that's not an argument to do anything. Um, of course, in today's world of safety management and assessment, you'd say actually, actually the opposite. If there's uncertainty and it's a safety issue and it really has large, large consequences, then you'd want to think twice before making that, that judgment. So uh, the, um, the accident countermeasures, oh, and, and then the final point, the severe accident countermeasures, so the sorts of things you've got in place for if, if it occurs, then your um, backup power systems, et cetera, et cetera, were not up to international standards, and apparently there'd been an intense industrial lobbying to not have changes uh, at this plant and elsewhere. So there was, there was a, a big struggle had gone on between the plant operators um, and, and, the, and the regulators. Um, about whether th uh, things should be changed. And, and there were, were clearly n things that should have been done that weren't. Um, more design issues. Power sources were put out of operation by the earthquake and, and were the, the backup diesel generators and, and other internal power equipment that were all pretty well located um, in a vulnerable spot. And that is Perot's normal accident. I think that is that this was so complex and put together that a sing in a sense the single event then led to a chain of failures which went through... Uh, reason Swiss cheese. It took out all of the redundancy that was there. Um, and they, there were assumptions about station blackout, um, and they never thought that they would completely lose power from all the systems. And again, that should have been um, more critically uh, interrogated. And the, there were bits about the control room being um, not in the right place. And again, they had all sorts of trouble because that lost power as well. Uh, as well as radiation, radiation monitoring. And that's just, just a picture of the site. I think Bout has, Bout has shown that. So most of the, the critical stuff was located close to where 
inundation was likely, likely to occur, as it did, as, and as we saw. So the organisation issue is interesting. So they focused on this in the Commission. There's a, there's a chapter on this. Um, and we investigated the enchant change events, events, what went wrong, um, and the relationship between TEPCO and the regulatory agencies. They had quite a struggle to get some data out of them, actually, so they had to sort of subpoena um, uh, data at, at some point, apparently. Um, so what they basically argue is that, that both the regulator and the, um, the owner were aware of the consequences of the major tsunami, but um, repeatedly and stubbornly, again, that's, that's really a strong word for an inquiry report to say, fail to evaluate and update their regulations and countermeasures. And this point, which is well known in the STS literature of what's called a regulatory capture, so they talk about a cosy relationship between the operators, regulators, and the academic scholars, so we're not entirely immune from criticism here. Um, uh, and, and that led to a culture of complacency, which didn't then question some of the safety assumptions. So the idea that there was a mindset, so remember the point that Diane Vaughan made about um, culture is a way of seeing, but it's also a way of not seeing, um, led to group insularity and failure to examine the assumptions. Um, and a, a, kind of a profound belief, which they probably held um, perfectly genuinely, that nuclear power was safe, it was guaranteed, this was a technically sophisticated system with technically sophisticated engineers and operators. Um, and yet underlying it, the real objective was assuring, assuring public confidence and maintaining production. Um, so the idea of regulatory capture and a far from an ideal safety culture, and I don't want to go into detail on safety culture, um, uh, but just to make, make the point that, that a lot of work has been done out, um, uh, in, uh, on that topic, um, particularly since the three theories that, w that I've mentioned were, um, were published, there was then a, quite a big effort well-funded, um, the oil industry, the aviation industry were, were quite, um, uh, and some nuclear, some nuclear industries, some parts of the nuclear industry were very um, proactive in trying to think through what, what proactive safety culture, organisational safety would mean. And, and actually it's, it's, it's quite straightforward things like um, top, top management commitment to safety, which then concatenates into the organisation. It's about having the appropriate rules, but being prepared to understand when the rules might not be working right. Uh, and then un understanding properly when you can break the rules or not, um, and learning organisations as well. So um, there are a number of things. Let me just done this again. Okay, let's just okay. Um, let's just go down. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about the accident. We can talk about that. I'm, I'm just going to make a couple more points, and then, then I will finish. Um, one is about the evacuation zone. We live actually. I'm not sure we're quite within 30 kilometres here from Finkley Point, but it's certainly where I live in Penarth. I'm certainly within the evacuation zone. And of course, this point about um, nobody died of radiation, there were 140,000 people uh, evacuated, Many, m most of them I think still evacuated, well, that's what I understand. Um, so there's an interesting question about the res you know, how this has impacted the local community and, and local people. So it's not that this wasn't um, a major event with major consequences for people. Notwithstanding, the tsunami itself was, a, it was an absolute tragedy for the country and an absolute disaster, but we're thinking about this in particular. And one of the interesting things, which we won't talk about in detail, I think, um, is, is, is if we look at our study of um, local um, communities around uh, nuclear power plants in the UK, we did um, both survey and uh, um, quite detailed biographical interviews with people um, living in around three of the major plants in, in the UK, all of which are actually new build sites now, but this was a few years ago now. And what we found, as, as we know, there's more general support for nuclear um, new build than in national samples, but it was more complicated, more nuanced um, sets of beliefs, uh, and it's not just pro and anti, and in fact the people who are very pro are more pro than people who are anti and more anti around the local sites. Um, benefits are important, but some of them were, um, uh, w were not necessarily always economic benefits. Familiarity with the plant was important, and interestingly, trust in the local managers. It's me doing this, isn't it? Um, somehow, okay, um, was very important as well. Um, but w what the analysis did show us was anxiety has always existed below the surface. So even if people said they were comfortable with nuclear power, they trusted the local plant, there was always a sort of lurking... Um, concern when certain topics came up in the interviews. So I'll just give you an example, and one would be if terrorist attacks were somewhere else. Um, one of the things, we've, we've not gone back to talk to these communities, 
Uh, although it's, it's a, it, it would now be, I think, be a legitimate research question to go and talk to some of the local nuclear communities about how the Fukushima accident um, affected them. And it's clear that when people who remember Chernobyl, obviously, others who were looking at the terrorist bombings in London, when events like that happen externally, it does make you question your local site. There was no doubt about that, that people said those were the, w the, the one occasion when anxiety occurred. And so, um, and talking kind of um, uh, informally with people who know people who live around some of the nuclear sites here, then that people, people have said, yes, once this accident occurred, then it, for a time I did it feel extremely anxious about um, living here, whereas before I hadn't uh, worried at all. So there's some interesting, I think some interesting research questions about the relationship between risk, trust and anxiety um, that, that relate to um, people who actually live uh, in proximity to, to nuclear power stations. Um, the other point about trust, we'll have a big discussion about trust and of course Vaus has already mentioned um, some of the trust work we did but what kind of came out of that with also another project with John Walls and others was this idea of critical trust um, which, uh, which really means that, that you wouldn't actually want full trust anyway because nobody fully trusts any organisation to... Uh, we put reliance on many organisations to do things, but it's actually quite healthy to have a certain level of scepticism as well. So I think we might discuss what... Uh, I mean, I, the really low levels of trust are unprecedented, um, both in Japan and, and to some extent in the UK, particularly given some of the, the other things that have gone on in other domains of public life. Um, but there's an interesting question about what the role of trust in, in all of this is. Um, and I think that, with five minutes to go, is about all I wanted to say, so thank you very much.